if there's an event that happens at that three and a half year point of the tribulation that changes Satan's mind, that makes him decide he wants to embody the beast itself. Lucifer once again tries to use the beast to ascend the Mount of God, but this time not the one in heaven, but the replica here on earth, the Temple Mount. He will go into the Holy of Holies and he will sit upon the mercy seat the cast hard time and he will declare to the whole world that he is Yahweh. We thank you so much for joining us today on our seventh program. We've had a lot of ups and downs in this mm. series today. Today's yeah. like, not so up. Yeah, right. Th this is not the top of the roller coaster. This no. is after you hit bottom. This, mm. this is our least favorite topic, or at least my least favorite. If you watch the Bearded Bible Brothers, we take no joy in discussing the abomination of the I don't know why I'm smiling. I'm sorry. It's, it's so heavy. It, right? it really is. It, go tell us. But it's so what important this? because this event is the culmination, the most pinnacle event in the life of Satan. This is what he has been working for for thousands of years, bringing uh, pride, rebellion, death, and destruction to humanity. It's all for this moment. You read in Isaiah 14, this is where his heart is at, is to commit this abomination. And we're going to see that it doesn't go quite as planned. So, <laughs> These guys are on location in Jerusalem. Let's go there now. I know you're in there. We're not in. Nobody's here. I'm coming in. Just watch the video. I don't want to talk about this today. All right, let's see what Jeff has to say. Fine. Gentlemen, you ever heard the expression when the devil has his day? Well, tell the story, please when the wicked inhabits the holy, when he takes his seat in the temple of God and defiles. Oh, they think he's a savior. He's a vulture. Tell the story. It's not easy to tell, but I know you're going to do it well. There's only one way we can do this. We've got to go to the Temple Mount today. No! You know, for the last five years, Caleb has tricked me into talking about the abomination of desolation on the Bearded Bible Brothers. But I never expected Jeff to do the same. <laughs> I feel betrayed. All right, fine, Jeff. We'll talk about all that terrible stuff, but we've got to build up to the real horrible event of the abomination. Guys, everybody likes to go into the timing of these revelation judgments. I mean, nearly every day people say, this seal is open, that trumpet blasted, this bowl of wrath was poured out. It's all garbage. None of these events can occur until Daniel 70 week begins. And that begins with the ratification of the peace treaty with the beast. Now, although some believe all these events are chronological, Josh, that is not the case. John, the apostle, was beyond time looking at all these events occurring around him like a panorama. Um, John Parsons, our, our Hebrew writer for the Levitt letter, calls it the helix of time. We do get these specific days for judgments later on in the, in the tribulation, but for right now, we're going to go over some events that we know for absolute certainty occur in those first three and a half years. And that's like before horsemen. We know that's going to happen. That's going to happen. Yeah. Revelation 6. <laughs> Uh, the, the seven seals are yeah. being opened. The first seal yeah. is the imposter messiah riding yes, on the white right. horse. That's the beast, guys. Uh -huh. He goes out um, only after the rapture takes place. Then the beast appears. But the second rider on the horse is wars, okay? Mm -hmm. And the beast goes to make war, and the results are bloody. Well, guys, the third is one of my least favorite. It's the yeah. inflation horse. It's why you don't have a 99-cent menu anymore. It, yes. it affects everyone. Okay, the fourth horse is death and destruction. A fourth of the world's population dies by famines, by, by plague, by war, by wild animals. I don't know how that happens, but we know a fourth of the population dies before a third and before half, so this is a prerequisite. The fifth is very sad. It showcases the Holocaust that happens to the remaining saints that believe in Yeshua. Yeah. And the sixth doesn't happen immediately after that. It's the double huh? helix effect we talked about there. Yeah. Um, that, that does not happen until the last day of the yeah. tribulation, the terrible day of the Lord, and we are guaranteed of that. Because that's the sun turning black and, and moon turning to blood. Exactly. Not until the last day, guys. So. Yeah, right, let's check this out, brother. All right, 
right, baby steps, guys. We will ascend the Abominated Mount. But before that, we decide to take a detour to the Western Wall first. It's like, you know, getting your stretches in before you do the big workout, and it builds proper suspense. You've never done the big workout, brother. Shut up, Josh. Babylon the Great, the kingdom of the beast, is inherently linked with the Babylon of the past. I've heard it said that Babylon is a bookends of history. This is absolutely accurate. Uh, the first Babel was created by Nimrod. He was this uh, one world dictator who united the world under one voice against God. And he had them build a tower. The Tower of Babel was a ziggurat uh, to mirror the former Mount of Congregation, Mount Eden. Nimrod made this deal with Satan because he wanted to fulfill his lifelong dream. Mm. Build a throne higher than El Elyon. The deal is, the scattered languages in Babel yeah. are going to limit the power of the beast and the dominion of the beast. That's right. That's why God scattered the languages so he would never have a one world dominion ever again. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now that passage in Isaiah is literally the most blasphemous defiance in all of Scripture. It's like the prologue. It gives the entire motivation for the villain of the story. The pride and arrogance of the creation to try to ascend higher than the Creator. Guys, the Neo-Babylonian Empire rose to power in 626 BC when Nebuchadnezzar's father, Nabopolassar, uh, joined an alliance with the Medes to throw off the yoke of Assyria, and they conquered Nineveh. Well, in Babylon, there was a, a temple to the god Marduk and Timanaki. You know, it's like Babel. People think that's the structure that Babel was. And once a year, uh, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, would go to the top of that temple and he would perform a ritual sex act with the temple prostitute showing himself to be part divine so the all these um babylonian kings were meant to be a representation of the god marduk himself and so will be the case also with the last nimrod and the last babylon lucifer once again tries to use the beast to ascend the mount of god but this time not the one in heaven but the replica here on earth the temple mount Ezekiel 28, 16 through 17 says, So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Satan became the prince of the power of the air, that second heaven that surrounds the earth in the spiritual dimension. When Adam gave up the keys of dominion, Satan took back the authority he once had over the earth. Mm. But Yeshua came and he took it back on the cross. That's right, guys. Uh, Satan and his fallen angels still hold thrones of power in this second heaven, in the spirit world. According to Ephesians 6:12, they are of the spiritual wickedness in high places. But there's an event that happens at that three and a half year point of the tribulation that changes Satan's mind, that makes him decide he wants to embody the beast itself. In Revelation 12, 7 through 9 says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. 
Yes, guys, this is a parallel prophecy, if you didn't know. Yes, Satan and his angels were cast down to earth at the beginning of time, but this event in the middle of tribulation, Josh, is when they're cast out of that second heaven down to the first heaven, they're trapped in our finite realm of time space. And now they go out in verse 12, seeking revenge on mankind. It says that therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. This leads us to the beast, who well has bitten off way more than he can chew. Mm -hmm. And not everybody's happy with the beast rule. In fact, three of his kings decide that they're gonna go ahead and plot against him. Right. But what really has to happen is that he has to get assassinated mm. so that Satan himself can come and dwell that dirty Nephilim shell mm. of a creature and become the true beast. Mm. Revelation 13, two through six. The dragon gave him, the beast, his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all of the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Oh, you thought I wasn't. That's cute. <laughs> you thought this was my first trip on this bridge. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. So here it is, the death and the resurrection of the beast. Mm -hmm. He, uh, he sores a head wound, the word says, mortal head wound, probably a gunshot, <laughs> and he dies, and then he's gonna be resurrected. Yeah. If I know Satan, who's resurrecting him, the dragon, he's probably gonna wait three days because he's got a flair for the dramatic. Right. After that three days concludes the 42 month period that is, takes us to the middle of the tribulation where he commits the abomination of desolation. That's right, guys, and this is where it all goes down on the Temple Mount. You know, Satan in the body of the beast, he will go into the temple. He will commit the abominable sacrifice. He will profane the altar, just like Antiochus Epiphanes did in the past, possibly sacrificing a pig on it. Um, he's going to set up an image, an idol to himself. You know, the image of the beast, so famous that we've heard about. And he will go into the Holy of Holies, and he will sit upon the mercy seat. The Kes Har Kaimim, and he will declare to the whole world that he is Yahweh. Oof, that's bad news, brother. Mm. Second Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Jewish people might have been duped at first by this false prophet thinking he's the Messiah and the beast is a friendly representative. All bits are off when they see this repeat abomination from times past because this beast will then stop the daily sacrifices and declare that they can no longer do the work of Elohim. Also bad news. It's a lot of bad news happening here, brother. All right, many of you may be wondering why we were using a selfie stick, whispering, and yes, panting on the Temple Mount. Well, this was really like Mission Impossible, guys. You know, it's illegal to do what we did on that mount, teaching the Bible by this Muslim shrine. We were evading the Muslim waqf, uh, literal spies that were hunting us down on the mount, and of course, your friendly IDF. We actually got caught once by one of those spies. They warned us not to film. What do you think we did? Daniel 8, 11 and 12. He, the beast, even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, Yeshua. And by him, the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn, 
to oppose daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Well, guys, the Jews know that they've been duped finally when the false prophet begins to blaspheme. He turns and he worships the beast. He even declares him to be Yahweh. But at this moment of desperation, when all hope seems lost, the two witnesses show up. God sends them, and they have supernatural strength. The beast demands worship, or else everyone must die. But there's supernatural strength, miraculous wonders with fire that comes from these two witnesses' mouth. Listen to what the scriptures have to say. Dude, that's epic. <laughs> Revelation 11, three through six. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Look at these pigeons. Bird! If anybody doesn't know, I have an obsession with birds. I just like to look at them. I think they're fascinating. I like to see them fly up and do all their little bird stuff. These birds don't seem to be worried by me. They're just flying around, doing all their bird stuff, saying, yeah, I'm a bird, and I'm good at my job. The beast and his armies can do nothing to stop the two witnesses, literally nothing. Then a miracle happens. 144,000 Jewish virgin males at least show up in the name of God. Yahweh appears on their forehead, sealing them. I suspect more than 144,000 will be saved by the witness of uh, two prophets, and they will remember Yeshua's words and flee to the wilderness to Basra, as it says in Matthew 24. No, 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 don't worry. Caleb was not translated from one spot to another. He's not that holy. Yet, this is what you call evasive maneuvers. This is what it's like to be hunted for the gospel. This is what happens when you try to preach on the Temple Mount. So, like any other good believer, I employed some tactics and distracted all the tiny Middle Eastern men by taking selfies with this beautiful Palestinian feline. Now back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, 15 through 18. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. All right, these, these two witnesses, according to Revelation 12, 14, are the two eagle's wings, not America. They will lead the Jews to a place of safety called Basra, a place where they'll be supernaturally cared for from the armies of the beasts. Scripture says in Micah 2, 12, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Basra, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall make great noise by reason of a multitude of men. The beast will pursue the Jews with his great armies. But just like the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, God will intervene supernaturally. The earth will open up and swallow those armies, every one of them. Revelation 12, 15 through 17. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keeps the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, guys, to summarize, Satan wastes no time of this last three and a half years of great tribulation to annihilate all the saints, all of God's people, but most importantly, the Jewish people. He's been waiting for this his whole life. He's going to stick it to God. He's going to wipe them off the face of the earth.
Well guys, we apologize for using the selfie stick. It's not our favorite method, but teaching the Bible on the Temple Mount is strictly forbidden. It's a shame and a travesty what the world has come to right here, but it's the case. But we would be remiss if we didn't offer everyone the opportunity, especially the Jewish people, to turn and to put their focus on the true Messiah, Yeshua. Choose him before the tribulation. Choose him before all these horrible, terrible events we've been talking about take place so that you too can spend eternity with him. John 14, 6, Yeshua said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you've watched the show for any period of time, you know how I feel about the abomination of desolation, but how about teaching about it illegally on the Temple Mount wow. when you're watching that you don't get thrown out, arrested, or shot? That was our experience. <laughs> it was fun, guys. And it's a very, really terrifying subject matter. It's a pinnacle moment in history. And just in case you think we, we were coming up with some of this stuff out of thin air, it's not really biblical doctrine, we decided to speak to an expert on this matter, Jeff Kinley. He's a pastor, he's an author, he's a Bible teacher, and he's gonna tell you more about the subject of the abomination. Uh, during the tribulation period, God's turning his attention back to Israel. Uh, he wants to woo Israel back, romance Israel back. It's going to be a horrible, terrible time for it, the nation of Israel during that time. But at that midpoint, Antichrist is going to break a peace treaty uh, that he made with the Israeli people. And during that time, he's going to enter into the Holy of Holies. Uh, Second Thessalonians tells us, uh, chapter 2, verse 4, he's going to commit the abomination of desolation, desecrate that place, and essentially proclaim himself to be God. Uh, he will exalt, him, exalt himself above every god or so-called object of worship. Uh, particularly this relates to the Jewish people because at that time there's going to be another attempted holocaust. Uh, Revelation 12 tells us he's going to go after the Jewish people. Uh, they're going to run to the wilderness. God's going to supernaturally protect them. But it will be a time of horrific persecution. So we see that Satan kind of throughout history wants worship for himself. Yeah. Uh, we see the shift uh, that happens in the type of worship before the abomination mm -hmm. with, with the one world religion right. and what, what happens after. What's the change in the way that they are worshiping the beast or the yeah. way everything shifts in that moment? Yeah, so, so there'll be a one world religion during the first part of the tribulation period, but Satan, because his long ambition is to, as you said, be worshiped and to rule the world, he's gonna do that through personifying himself through the Antichrist. So at that point, he's gonna basically say, look, I'm tired of these other religions. Uh, uh, Christianity's gotta go, the rapture's already happened. Uh, Islam's gotta go, that'll probably happen with the Ezekiel 38, 39 war. And then all that's left is the Jews. And so it all the bullseye goes back to the Jewish people. Uh, and so Satan is going to put a target on them, try to exterminate them from the planet. And that's when that, mid -time, that midpoint uh, event happens with the abomination of desolation. So that, in essence, though, God will use that uh, to help the Jewish people come to know him because you'll have 144,000 young Jewish male, uh, Billy Graham's essentially, you know, preaching the gospel everywhere. You're gonna have the two witnesses that are doing incredible miracles during that time. Uh, the temple will be rebuilt during that time as well. So I think that will illustrate uh, what uh, Yeshua has done for the Jewish people and the two witnesses will point to that. And so it'll be a time I think where uh, the Bible says one third of the Jewish people will come to faith in him and thus all Israel will be saved as Paul said in, in Romans 11. I know that today we're talking about the abomination, mm -hmm. but haven't there been past ones, the, the Maccabees, yes. Hanukkah, and then 70 AD? So was it fulfilled in 70 AD? Is it still coming? Yeah. Or, you well, know? that's interesting. They're like parallel prophecies. I believe prophecies have fulfillment in the, sometime in the present and also in the future. Um, the abomination of desolation, the Hashakutz Hamshomim that's talking about, Yeshua said in Matthew 24, 15, it hasn't been fulfilled. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel, so he's saying, oh, that that happened, that was just Satan's dress rehearsal. Kind of like uh, the many antichrists, but many not antichrists. the same yeah. kind of thing. They can carry the spirit of the antichrist upon them. So I think we should look at Daniel 9.27 because there's more to this uh, prophetic fulfillment than we know. Daniel 9.27 says, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even unto the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So that 
uh, desolation, that word in Hebrew is meshomem. Now it has a double meaning. Yes, desolation, destruction, but it also means to wonder, to marvel. It's like when you get an epiphany, you're like, that's I can't stop focusing on it. So literally the beast, he brings scorched earth wherever he goes and people just stare on him and wonder at his destruction. So this abomination is, is two parts. They can't but marvel at the horror and the brilliance of it at the same Ow. time. It's Ooh. meshomem. Yeah. It's Ooh. crazy. Uh, there, there's another Hebrew word I want to uh, discuss. It's, it's the uh, consummation, charatz. And that, uh, it, it's another one of those double meaning words because it means something to come to fruition, to destiny, and it's rooted in Goran, a hard labor person. So basically what we're talking about here is something that Satan is doing that is destined from the beginning of time, but it's his doom, his destruction that is destined. It's also written in Nekarats, where we get Nathal, the fall, like in Nephilim. It's a root from Nephilim. So he has already had his doom sealed and is coming upon him, and there's nothing that he can do to stop it. And he's, as he creates destruction, destruction and doom is coming upon him. And this is why you always read at the end of the story, because then as he finally sits down, it's his day after all of his life, the two witnesses show up, Enoch, Elijah, yeah. they got 144,000 with them and they're leading people to Yeshua. It's amazing. Ah, wow. That is a lot in a moment. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. It's moment. a topic that we really have to discuss. Yeah. And we know that you have many more topics that you want to bring to this ministry. We couldn't do any of that without your help. We ask you to pray about giving to this ministry. We thank you so much for that. We'll be right back. Our resource this week, the book, The Iranian Menace in Jewish History and Prophecy by Dr. Jeffrey Seif. As Iran continues to capture the world's attention with threats and tactical support of Israel's enemies, Dr. Seif uses scriptural and secular evidence to support his case for the Iranian Armageddon Connection. Contact us and ask for the book, The Iranian Menace. We hope you will stay with us through this whole series. It's really like a roller coaster ride. Ups and downs, good and bad. What's coming up next week? Next week is not upbeat either. Next week. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's very sad. It, it deals with the last three and a half years of the tribulation, um, the, the most powerfully devastating time in the history for the Jews, the time of Jacob's trouble. Yeah. So it's going to be a really rough episode next week. But we do know there's good news way at the end. Amen. Okay, yes. that's Hang coming. Yeah. Yeah. Time to go, guys. And guys, remember to always Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. As a 100% viewer-funded ministry, your gifts allow us to bring you our weekly television series, social media outlets, website, and other ministry endeavors. Call us anytime at 1-800-WONDERS and ask about this week's resource. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.